Hello, fourth grade. Our story is starting to get very exciting. So now we are up to, let me see here, chapter six. February 12th, 1849. If you have never taken part in the departure of a great ocean sailing ship, I pity you. One cannot begin to comprehend the commotion and exhilarating chaos that prevails. It is like 4th of July and New Year's Eve in one. And in my view, all great changes in life should be celebrated so. Consider the Providence Wharf that cold and blustery day with bits of confetti-like snow flecking the air. Crowds of people going on and off the great three-mast ship, the Stephanie K. People joyfully or tearfully wishing one another well. People with faces of sorrow. People with faces full of glee. People engaged in heart-clinging farewells. People making hasty goodbyes as if separation could not come fast enough. On the wharf, men's tall hats so numerous, it was like a city of smokeless chimneys. Faces full of expectations. Faces full of dread. Faces pale, faces flushed, tears and laughter bucketing from the same hearts. Need I say more? An entire encyclopedia of emotions. Or if you prefer, as I did, a perfect melodrama complete with music, for there on the wharf was a church choir that sang an optimistic hymn that God should bless us all. There was too all manner of cargo trunks, bales, and boxed belongings, which need to be brought aboard. Food and water were likewise carried on. Of course, midst the mingling multitudes of immigrants was the sailing crew for which the Stephanie K numbered 32 plus officers, including a captain with an elegant beard. In other words, a swirling, swarming, and scintillating ship. The anticipation was intoxicating. Even I, who was never touched art, had never touched ardent spirits, knew that this was intoxicating. Father, being 49 years of age, looked to be the oldest passenger. Most of the travelers on board, there were about 170 in total, were young men going to California for gold. Gold fever at its highest temperature. Indeed, the word gold buzzed in my ears as if I were standing amidst a swarm of bees in search of summer's golden nectar. On board, there were only a few women and fewer children. That, I admit, gave me a feeling of trepidation, but I was bolstered by a resolve that was churning like a nor'eastern storm about to burst. Father and Jacob had made their leave takings to mother at her bedside in my Aunt Lavinia's house. Those moments were truly tender and with as much sentiment and clear declaration of love as my parents were capable of expression. Dear wife, I shall think of you often. Beloved husband, I shall pray for your success. In secret, I had made my own goodbyes to mother the night before. I think mother had begun to relish the family intrigue as much as I did. I rather suspect she was finding being a convalescent under the imperial eye of Aunt Lavinia even drearier. Indeed, mother, now very much wishing to travel west herself, spoke of embarking on one of the fast new clipper ships as soon as she was able. As for the undoubted assurance of my father's great wealth to come, it lifted her spirits and was a buffer against Aunt Lavinia. Come as quickly as you can, I urged her. Everything will be better there, she said, to me as much as to herself. Dearest mother, thank you for believing in me. Know that I shall always have you in my thoughts and heart. On the day of departure, I accompanied father and Jacob upon the Stephanie K. There was no hindrance to my boarding since many people were going on to say goodbye to passengers. Midst all the churning of emotions and embraces, no one questioned why I was there. Once on board, as planned, I asked that Jacob be allowed to show me his sleeping place that father had reserved. Of course, father agreed. 
In haste, my brother led me below. I quickly learned that upon these large ships, there's the main deck and the bottom hold wherein the cargo was carried. Between these two areas was the tween deck, where passengers had their belongings and their sleeping compartments. I was surprised that these sleeping compartments consisted of nothing more than what looked like crudely constructed shelves for library books. The shelves were hardly more than 25 inches wide. All the time, I was much relieved to see Jacob's luggage stowed there in his particular trunk, which contained my disguise. I now knew where I could find it. When Jacob and I saw the trunk, we exchanged self-assured conspiratorial grin. Where's the ladies' room? I asked. I have no idea, he returned. While that unnerved me, there was absolutely no time to pause and investigate, so we hastened back to the main deck. Once there, the three of us, Father, Jacob, and I, went to the gangway, where I spoke what hoped sounded like a heartfelt goodbye to Father and Jacob. As soon as that was accomplished, I walked down the gangplank to the wharf, turned back, and waved a flamboyant goodbye. After they, in turn, saluted me, I took a few steps away. Immediately, Jacob did as I instructed him. He pulled at Father's great coat and dragged him away to see something far on the corner of the great ship. Then came the most thrilling moment up to that time of my entire life. I rushed back onto the ship via the same footbridge. Once on board, I raced down to Jacob's berth. Had I not already learned the way? But since I had not discovered where the woman's quarters were, and with my heart beating like an uncaged bird, I had no choice but to open Jacob's trunk and withdraw from its bottom the clothing I had purchased. The tween deck was teeming with people, passengers, families, and crew bidding farewell. Thus it was that no one cared when I flung a blanket over myself. Beneath it, I dressed as a man in trousers and a shirt and boots. My long chestnut hair was stuffed into a black top hat, which sat low upon my brow. When I stepped free and assaged my appearance, I had to suppress my glen at glee as to how I must have looked. Did a, ever a girl's heart flutter so? Leaving my girl's attire in Jacob's trunk, I returned to the main deck, there to mingle among the multitudes of young men. Let it be said, it is fine to be noticed, but it is delightful to be invisible. Warning whistles began to be piped. Ship departure. Passengers who were embarking lined the rails and waved to those who retreated to the wharf. At the library in Providence, I had read Mr. Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Purloined Letter, which had impressed me with the idea that the best hiding place is right out in the open. I, therefore, remained at the top rail in full view, in my costume, of course, and waved to the people on the dock as if I was saying goodbye to my own kin. Sure enough, although I stood boldly before all, I went completely unnoticed. Despite the snow, the crew climbed the rigging like springy spiders. Sails from flying jibs at the bow to spanker at the stern to the main royal, the topmost sail, loosened and sheeted home. The lines that bound the Stephanie K to the east coast of the United States were cast off. Our ship was warped into the Narragansett Bay. Having wind and tide in our favor, off we went. It was absolutely thrilling, so that I fairly tingled with delight. No one, save me, my brother Jacob, knew I was a stowaway. I suppose it is immodest to say but I was exceedingly pleased with myself. There I was engaged in a true adventure. None of my mother's romance books equaled this. I was the heroine in my own story. We sailed down Narragansett Bay with a colony of seagulls as our airborne escort. To my ears, their squawk sounded as if they were laughing with glee, echoing my own delight. Above the bulky willowy, billowy sails, were our own clouds. With the bay water smack smooth, there was little in the way of a disturbing movement. Shortly after we embarked, all passengers were called upon the deck 
and the captain welcomed us <clears throat> by reading out his rules. All passengers must rise by 7 a.m. unless excused by the ship's doctor. Bedtime is no later than 10 p.m. No breakfast until all decks are swept and your bedding is stowed. No liquor is allowed. The use of gunpowder is strictly prohibited. A religious service will be held every Sunday morning by our chaplain. All are required to attend. My first mate shall make sure all of these rules are enforced. You can easily imagine how impatient I was, but I had to stay in disguise until we were fully set out to sail. Mind, I needed to go to hide for only the first, mind you, I needed to hide for only the first two days of a seventh month voyage. It greatly helped that during those first days, the ship was in a state of continual disarray as passengers learned their way about. In addition, the Stephanie K was fairly packed with young men, a great many of whom were beardless youths. And since I didn't look so different from them, I went unnoticed. To further support my ruse, I refrained from speaking, not wishing to reveal my feminine voice. Jacob and I had planned where and when to meet. At these appointed moments, he brought not just a friendly face, but he brought food, drink, and at our first meeting, a blanket. Yes, I might have eaten at the common table, but I would prefer to take a few extra precautions. For me, the next 48 hours were the most challenging. We sailed down the Narragansett Bay, twixt Point Judith and Newport, and then out upon the awe-inspiring Atlantic Ocean. I slept those first two nights on deck, one among many sleepers. To be sure, I was cold, but I learned that if you are going to be a heroine in your own adventure, a certain amount of discomfort is obligatory. At last, we reached the open sea. By day, oh, the sublime, endless wonder of it. No land in sight, only ceaseless blue sky and white-capped foaming waves. Sails fluffed and snapped as the ship hissed and spanked through the wash. By night, a vast array of frozen stars. As we sailed, we pitched, bobbed, rolled, enough to make people ill. Father was one of those, but I'm glad to report, not to me. To the contrary, my healthy heart fairly swelled in an attempt to match the immensity of the ocean, a seemingly less endless world. How shall I express it? I loved myself for loving it all. If I could, I would have hugged the universe. After two days had passed, I met up with Jacob. He managed to maneuver father out of his berth, where he lay in seasick discomfort. Once he left, I again ducked beneath, beneath his blanket, this time to change back into my woman's attire. When I emerged, no one took any particular notice of me, appearing as the girl I truly was in a modest twim, trimmed bonnet in a full length high neck dress with wide sleeves at my wrists. I also wore mother's red shawl, as if indifferent, but hardly so, I walked about the main deck until I spied father standing by the bulk board rail, gazing out upon the sea, perhaps pondering the immense change in his life and in his unhappy belly. I paused, relishing this moment. Oh, such wonderful drama. When the curtain lifts, is it not delightful to be the center of the stage? Sir, I called out to him, Mr. Blaisdell, that is the end of chapter six. I don't think I can stop. I think I'll read a little bit of chapter seven. I don't know how long it is, but we'll try. Chapter seven. Father turned and looked at me without comprehension. It was that curious truth. The familiar and an unfamiliar place is often unseen. It took some full moments before he grasped that it was me. When he did realize it was his daughter who stood before him, she, whom he thought he'd left behind in Providence, his face displayed complete bewilderment. What, what, he stammered, are you doing here? I almost said, my will has decided my destiny. But instead, I replied, I am going to San Francisco. Father, perfectly dumbfounded, managed to say, but how, 
how did you get here? I told him. Does mother know? She approved. Did she? He cried, newly aghast, and I suspect feeling somewhat betrayed. But, but what do you intend to do in California? I am quite sure, father, that you can care for yourself. For my part, I intend to take care of Jacob and keep our fine new house. Meanwhile, you shall be free to gather that abundant gold. At dinner time each day, I shall serve you your meal and you shall regale us with your daily adventures of your new wealth. These words, though surely stilted, had been well practiced by me to soothe his ear. I had composed them with that goal in mind. But though that is what I said, let it be clearly understood. My vision of the future was to be far more energetic than that. I cared little for gold. My desire was to become fully independent, have intelligent people around me, and somehow, I was not exactly how, how yet, amaze the world. I had already learned that for a girl, the more ambitious you are, the better it is to keep that secret within. What did my father do when he realized that I was on the ship and that there was no way he could send me home? He did what most people do when confronted with something that they cannot control. He acted as if it was always meant to be. What's more, the constant degree of congestion on the ship was such that no one in authority ever realized I was dodging a fare. You may be sure father was too embarrassed to acknowledge that. There was something more. I do believe father looked upon me with the realization that I was far more capable than he had thought me before. That pleased me. But now that I had resumed my female garb, I was confronted with another problem. As I learned, there were no separate accommodations for females. The ship's chaplain, who was migrating to California, was traveling with his wife. No doubt because of his calling, they had their own tiny cabin beneath the rear deck. As for the two other wives on board, one with a little boy, they simply shared bunks with their respective spouses. As for the other girls my age, there were none. I, was, I will be the first to admit that this was a circumstance to which I had given no thought. Further, no complaint could be made to the ship's captain because to begin with, I had no business being on board. And as I have said, my father and I were not going to draw attention to my dishonest presence. However, considering how passengers were lodged on that tween deck, my being there proved no great difficulty. Jacob and I shared a shelf, head to toe, toe to head. Father, with a gallantry I had not expected, took his sleeping on the deck planking with no softening save some blankets. We slept in regular clothing, but the ship's owners, seeking to maximize profits by the flood of passengers seeking gold in California, had booked far more people than the shelf beds they had hastily constructed to accommodate them. Thus, people were truly a swarm on their berths, on the deck, in every nook and cranny and corner, wherever they could sleep, sit or stand. Since the little light that existed on the tween deck came from a few lantern lights, one had the impression of a dark crowded church with barely a clear vision as to who was next to you. Nor did it smell good, being stenchy and close. Though all were required to clean their spaces, it remained a filthy place. Hardly a wonder then that the weather was bright, fair and mild, and even when it was not, many a passenger, including me, spent their days on the main deck, breathing in the unsullied sea air. When I needed to change my clothes, the chaplain's wife was kind enough to provide me and the two other women moments of privacy in her cap cabin. However thrumming the departure of a great ship might be and the undeniable adventure of being a stowaway, the seventh month voyage of the Stephanie K, which followed, was, I fear, tenfold tedious. The truth is, our voyage was disappointingly dull to the extreme. If I were to describe it in full detail, you would put these pages down and never return to this book. Would you enjoy reading February 20th, sailed six knots, February 21st, sailed seven knots, spied ship on the distant horizon, February 22nd, 
sailed three knots, saw nothing but waves. There were much the same. I trust you will agree that it is wise that I don't share every detail of, in every moment of my voyage with you. But here are some details you should know. The ship. The decks never stayed level or still, but continually shifted so that the timbers forever groaned and creaked like old people's bones. Food. It was grim. Salted meats, hard biscuits, beans, bad tasting water. Eating times at the long common tables on the tween deck were raucous with displays of truly appalling manners. Passengers, endlessly impatient, constantly complaining about crowded conditions and our slow speed, criticizing the captain no matter what he did, forever arguing amongst themselves about matters mostly minor. Some things were unusual. I received 14 offers of marriage. When the first came from a tall gentleman with an enormous mustache, I was shocked. When the second proposal came from a dandy with the smell of rose perfume, I was puzzled. By the 14th proposal, I could only laugh. Naturally, I refused them all. I didn't tell father of these offers. I did, did tell Jacob, and I do believe it began to alter his vision of me. It was one thing to have an older sister. It was quite another to have a married sister. It was as if only then did he realize our lives would be different. But then I think boys think far less about the future than girls do. Regarding amusements, whenever I saw someone reading a book, particularly a multi-volume novel, which was more often than you might expect, I made bold to inquire if, when they were done, I might borrow it. Thus, I read fine new publications such as Oliver Twist, Wuthering Heights, and Vanity Fair. Books different from one another, but good and happily long. I extended the time of reading by sharing them when I told them aloud to Jacob. In fact, most of the time I spent in Jacob's company. But then I hold that more I hold that more one loves another, as Jacob and I do, the less reason there is for talk. Silence is a form of tranquility. Beware companions who require talk. Being together should be enough. So it was that for many a long hour and days, Jacob and I leaned against the rail and did little more than gaze upon the endless gray-blue sea. At night, I read him books by lantern until we slept. To be sure, during the voyage, there were moments of interest. Most exhilarating was when it seemed as if the ship was in peril, such as when we passed through what the sailors called the Willows, the roiling savage wintry temptus at the south, southernmost point of South America. One's life, I decided, is enhanced when embracing danger. How cold was it when we ran around the horn? Ice crusted the rigging and coated the rails and had to be broken off with mallets. Why the captain's beard froze so that he had to lean over a heated stove to thaw it out. Winding our way through those channels, it took four men to control the steering. The ship bowled and dipped so that no sides on the shelf burst. People just rolled out as they slept. One man broke his arm. Many people became seasick. Cape Horn, the forlorn bit of land which marked the southernmost spot of South America, rose, I was informed, to 1,200 feet and was snow covered. The captain's skill brought us out into the Pacific Ocean and there we headed north where the sea gradually became calm and the sun grew warm. The cities at which we paused, Rio de Janeiro and Brazil, Calio and, and Peru, take on, to take on fresh food and water were fascinating to see, quite exotic. But only I seemed interested. The truth is there was little concern upon, upon the Stephanie K for anything other than San Francisco and gold. If anticipation were riches, we would already have been the wealthiest ship at sea. 
I admit I spent much time imagining what lay before me. I thought of San Francisco as a city of prodigious beauty set upon a picturesque bay, as it had been described, a metropolis full of riches and elegant things, altogether serene with strong, handsome, and dare I say it, wealthy people. It was often called El Dorado, recalling that mythical city of fabulous wealth. This is to say, I populated the city with every bit of my wishful imagination. As for where the easy gold might be found, I envisioned a stately forest with wide earthly paths, bordered with glittering nuggets of gold, which I gathered like dropped ripe apples. Quickly, our family life would be endowed with fabulous riches like those in the fairy tales. But as we were coming up the coast of Mexico, drawing even nearer to our goal of California, things began to change for me yet again in a major way. Okay, we're going to see what changes she speaks of. But we're going to stop now because I read you two chapters. And um, I hope you're liking it. And when I come back, I'll start with chapter eight. Bye for now.